Well, today is uh, July 31st, 2013, and tonight's message is going to be the King's Domain. So you got your Bibles with you? Amen. Yes, we do. Awesome. The King's Domain. We put those two words together, and what word do we come together with? Kingdom. So Justin's word shared during worship had to do with seeking the kingdom of God to the point where you were relinquishing everything that you had of value. So I love it how the Holy Ghost works. All right. I'm going to cover four major points. I want to just lay things out there directly to let you know exactly where I'm going. The four major things that I want to hit with the, the king's domain is the problem. Number two, the verdict. Number three, the cost. Number four, the kingdom. Got those? The problem, the verdict, the cost, and the kingdom. So our first one, the problem. Everybody look to your neighbor and say, I got a problem. <laughs> now we're going to dig a little bit deeper and see exactly what it is. So the king's dom dominion, the kingdom of God, was designed to be at work, at rule, at authority, and in charge, beginning with the heart of man. So that means that every human being that ever was created is created or will be created is designed in such a way that their heart is to inha be inhabited by the working of the kingdom of God. But we have a primary problem. So everybody turn to Ezekiel 36. I'm getting there to you. Ezekiel 36, let's start in verse 24. For I will take out of you, the, I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Well, I think where we all begin in some state or fashion is having a heart of stone. But these four principles of the problem, the verdict, the cost, and the kingdom, I can parallel to a, a car repair, right? So cars, much like Ford 6.0s, can be deceptive. They can have this lustrous allure of having it all together good size good tires good uh, interior upholstery even the outside can be polished but what's one thing that gets into the element of of cars particularly the metal that it can look beautiful on the outside but it's corroded on the inside rust it can go unseen and it's not until you begin to peel back some of the layers of the exterior you pull out the seats, you remove the carpet, you begin to look at the true interior of that truck, and you look at its core function, and you begin to find that there's a cancer. Rust is like a cancer within metal. It begins to oxidize. It destabilizes it. It removes its ability to bond and maintain its integrity and strength. Sin is the problem. Sin got into the heart of mankind, not just the exterior of hair falling out, much like what you see here on display on my forehead, or getting older. Sin began with going into the interior of man, despite what the outer appearances could be. And what God promised within Ezekiel 36 wasn't that I'll give you a new dress, ladies, uh, I'll give you a new bass boat or new truck, guys, or something on the exterior to make you feel like what you have on the inside is not existing, meaning the cancer, the sin. He said, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. You know, the process about being born again is that it is a transformation on the inside, and it results on the outside. 
We can never, ever, ever invert that process. You must be born again. So you still in Ezekiel 36? Let's read this over again. Let's start it with verse 25. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all of your, what's that next word? Come on, what's that next word? Say it loud. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. So the problem here is our sin, our missing the mark. So let's go to the book, the first book in the Word that begins to highlight this problem of sin. Any guesses what it would be? Genesis. Are you all awake tonight? I want to say this morning. It kind of feels like the morning. Come on, y'all get alive. Talk to me. I need some feedback. Not in the, in the system, but from you guys. So Genesis, very good. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 through 8. There, awesome. Awesome, awesome. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all, all the time. Next verse. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on earth, and his heart was filled with pain. Whose image is man made in of? God's. Here's the more important question. Whose image are you made of? In whose image are you made in? God's. I think when we read Genesis, the trouble that we have is seeing ourselves within the word. We look and see, first and foremost, that if we are made in the image of God, that God has a heart, we have a heart. God has a spirit, we have a spirit. We notice similarities, but what begins to surface immediately when you stand in the presence of God, the full presence, is that you notice that there is a disparity. That within the heart of man, after the fall, came what was called to the, in Hebrew, the Yetzirah. This is the evil inclination. So let's go to Genesis chapter 8, verse 20 and 21. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of man, even though every inclination of his heart is evil from childhood. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. This is yet an, another instance upon instance upon instance that what grips the heart of mankind is the propensity, the evil inclination, the yetzerah that wants to disobey God. It goes against the grain of what God desires. But I want to key something to you real quick. It's not that we're hopeless. We know we're not hopeless. We worship tonight and are able to get into his presence because we do have hope by the blood of Jesus. But I want to show you. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma that Noah sacrificed and said in his heart, he made a promise of hope for all mankind. That the propensity, the evil inclination of our heart in a non-born again state is to disobey God. God's heart, God's leaning is always to redeem, rescue, restore his image. It is all about his image. Come on, somebody quote to me John 3, 16. God gave his son. When we go through Ezekiel 36, he's saying, I will. Is this Ezekiel speaking? No. Who is it that's declaring that I will do these things? The Lord will do these things. Hope this is beginning to build hope within the midst of the identification of the problem. But we've got a few more things to, to cover. James 4, chapter 1. Turn there. While you're turning, I want to ask you a question. You can show me by the raising of your hands or just an amen. Do you ever have problems? Are the majority of them you? <laughs> hey, there we go.
undergo some good honesty. So James 4, chapter 1. This is one that convicts me nearly on a daily basis. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? James was not called by James by his mama. James was Yaakov, is a derivative of Jacob. What he is expressing in his book is the Hebrew principle of Yetzirah. He memorized, James did, memorized Genesis. So when he is writing this, he's looking throughout the storyline of mankind's history, but definitely from a Jewish perspective of the Yetzirah. And he's able, as a, as a pastor of the church in Jerusalem, look right to the center of their problems and say, it's not this red herring or that yellow herring or that blue herring. It is your evil inclination that's at work. Look, while I was studying today, I hear my girls in the other room. And I can tell by the pitch and tone of their voices exactly what's going on. I can tell if it's a laughter or a cry. I can tell if it's just a conversation or beginning to be an exasperation or complaining and chiding at the other. And I begin to hear the latter. I begin to hear this complaining and arguing. And particularly one began to express very emotionally what her desires were that the others do. So I'll pull them both aside. I ask them some detailed questions that I just want yes or no answers to. And then I conclude that it was the evil inclination of this one to be selfish, and was, she was the source of the quarreling and fighting. When we come and get in the presence of God and worship, but here's more importantly, as we hide God's word in our heart, it teaches us not to sin against him because it is there to constantly address what the problem is. If I do not hide God's word within my heart, I will not have a standard to measure my fights, my quarrels, and my desires by. And I will probably justify myself every single time and condemn the other person or the situation for the fault. Make myself a victim and uh, justify my own sin. Can everybody relate to that? I, if I'm preaching to myself, that's okay. That's just fine. I'm all right with that. Okay. So Hebrews chapter 3. Let's turn there. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12 through 13. Now, in Ezekiel 36, the Lord said, I will take from you your heart of stone, and I will give you a heart of flesh. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12 says, See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Verse 13. But encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be, what's that word? Hardened. hardened by sin's deceitfulness. The problem where we have to begin is when we have God's word calling out our sin, we have to, to discern. We have to cut right to the chase so that we're not deceived into missing the mark of what God is requiring for your life. When you are, have God's word at work within you, you're not going to be deceived. But if it's just trickling or it's come to a complete stop of how much you put your face in front of it, how much you hide it in your heart, how much you apply it to you before you apply it to other people, what will begin to happen is this callousing effect. You won't feel God's presence as sensitively as you did before. That scripture will not come to mind as easily as it did before because something in your heart is developing uh, a callous due to sin residing there. So I play the guitar. On these four fingers, or of these four fingers, I can use none of them to use a touch phone. It is painful when driving sometimes because the calluses on the tip of my fingers somehow do not allow my fingers to register on any touch device. I'm sitting there hitting it, and it's like hitting it with another piece of wood over and over again. I can't feel anything, but that, the device cannot respond to me either. 
It's to the point where the only way to rectify the situation is to take out my knife and cut away the callus that, doesn't, but that is hindering my sensitivity to what I'm interacting with, but also its recognition of my interaction with it. How do you solve the callousness that begins to build up within your heart? When you apply God's word, it is exactly like it says in Hebrews 4, chapter 12. I mean, chapter 4, verse 12. That it is a double-edged sword. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of our heart. I can't stress to you how important it is to constantly be swimming, having the word in you, around you, part of your conversations, your fellowship, everywhere that you go. Because what it's able to do is constant is remove any of that callousness that is built up as a result of something trying to deceive you of what's right and what's wrong. Can you all agree that that's what the devil did? He entered into the serpent in the Garden of Eden. He took God's word and twisted it to Eve in order to cater to a desire to be more like God. Now, if I told you tonight, or asked you, who in here wants to be more like God? You, everyone would raise their hand and say amen, and rightfully so. But when you are being tempted with being more like God outside of God's prescribed plan, that is sin. That's absolute sin. So y'all feel like we're getting a hold on what the problem is with the king's domain? And we have to solve that problem. All right. Skip down to, in Hebrews 3 to verse 16, and we'll read through 19. Who were they that heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the desert? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? Here's where it's at. So we see that we were not able to enter because, or they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Unbelief. Romans 11 talks about branches being cut off, original branches from the root of Jesse, Israel. And the branches that were cut off were cut off because of their unbelief. Unbelief breeds or always leads to missing the mark with God. And do you, does anybody remember what did Israel do in the desert that expressed their unbelief? They complained. They grumbled. What, wouldn't, wouldn't you think that whenever Moses came down with the two tablets the first time and he found them drunk, having orgies, and fashioning an idol, a golden calf, and worshiping it, that that would have been it, that's enough, they're cut off, throw them away, let's start over? It wasn't until they got to the place where God was expecting and demanding of them to depend upon him as their source and they grumbled and complained. And the final straw that broke the camel's back was when they looked into the promised land. And 10 out of the 12 spies from Israel said, nope, we are grasshoppers in their eyes. This isn't going to work. Their unbelief was expressed in actions, but first and foremost, with their mouths. The problem is that evil inclination. And come on, when you think about the word evil, what do you think about? The guy with the... You know, the long mustache, the shifty, beady eyes, and the fingers that do like this, and plots evil. Evil inclination is to do something other than what God is leading you to do. And that causes you to miss the mark, if not miss the inheritance that the blood of Jesus has paid for you. Guard your mouths. Make sure they're not expressing the yetzerah, the evil inclination that's at work. But as we get to what the solution, the kingdom of God is, you'll see that you are not powerless, but you are made powerful by what Jesus did to overcome this problem that every mankind has. Y'all want to learn more about it? Come on, let's do it. The verdict. Everybody say the verdict. The verdict. Give me two types of verdicts. What do we have within the court? Guilty or not guilty. I went to traffic court, and we had the opportunity to tell the judge, either guilty or not guilty. Or no kind. No this brother knows from experience. Look at that. <laughs> Bam. When we stand before the judge, our actions 
will be written in these books and the books will be open and there will be a verdict about how you dealt with the problem of the Yetzirah, of the evil inclination within your heart. What did you do with it or about it? So let's turn to John chapter 3, verse 16. Now, John 3, 16, everybody knows it by heart. We see it on billboards. We see it in, you know, uh, baseball stadiums, football stadiums. Everybody's holding it up. But we interpret the word in light of the word, right? So we don't read Judas hung himself and then skip over and go and do likewise. We read the word in light of what the word says. So beginning in verse 16 of John, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Now, usually in our quotation of this, it's verse 16 and 17, if we read on, it has a little shock to our system. It shocks our typical interaction with these verses. Because you could conclude from this verse that God is this big vat of love that wants to pour on everybody. And there should be no condemnation, no consequence, no harping on what's wrong, no identification of what the problem is. But let me be straight, honest, and true. When you look into the reality of who God is and you stare eye to eye with what his words say, there is the hope of being found not guilty. But the reality is that you are. The reality is that there is a redemptive plan, but you have to take the blood of the Passover lamb and put it over your doorpost in order for death to pass you over. And that verdict for your life to be not guilty even though you were. Verse 18. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned. So let me get this right. He sent his son not to condemn the world, but to save it. And whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. So if Jesus did not to condemn, who condemns you? You do. Your actions condemn you. So we can definitely say and quote Romans 8.1, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, and rightfully so. But the antithesis of that is absolutely true. There is condemnation for those outside of Jesus. That wasn't the mission and goal of what Jesus came to do. That is the byproduct of your disobedience to God. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, it's my fault. Say it loud. I'm not hearing that loud enough. It's my, it's my, fault. It's my, it's my fault. That's not like me apologizing to my wife. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men loved darkness instead of light because their, e their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that he has done that what he has done has been done through God. In the end, who gets the glory? Now get this. Let me shift your paradigm. In the end, God gets glory through your obedience to him, but your disobedience invokes his wrath, and he gets glory in that as well. Come on, don't frown at me. You watched those movies before, where the evil man or person who's gotten away with literal murder throughout the movie, and at the very end, he is caught and brought to justice. That justice is a reward for the righteous. So God, in the end, gets the glory, and his name is made great. 
Because the verdict is dependent upon the obedience of man. God has already set the standard. He made or restored the earth and the universe in six days, and he rested. And that rest still remains. His work is in continuum and yet done. The decision is no longer his to make. It's yours. John chapter 3, verse 5. Let's skip to that. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. Everybody say truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Verse 6. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. Jesus came to declare the truth. And the verdict has everything to do with living by the truth. Either you do live by the truth or you don't live by the truth. And what determines the outcome is your obedience to it. And that first step of obedience is being born of the Spirit. Now, I've had the wonderful opportunity to be a part of the birthing process of four of my children. I wish we would have done it at home without anesthesia. I just, I preferred it that way. But my wife said no. And I'll, we'll see you next time. So, <laughs> and the one thing I can say is that from the get-go, watching the Miracle of Life video at the hospital, and all, you know, learning about the whole birthing process, it's a miracle. It's an absolute miracle that when the zygote is formed, that you have this creation of life immediately. And that God's spirit gives life to what's going inside a, a woman's womb. And as it grows and as it is birthed, it comes out a living being made in the image of God. What we now have is the opportunity to share with others the miracle, life-giving power that Jesus can give to someone's spirit. You have spirits that are disconnected from God. It's outside of his light and outside of his life. When someone is born of the spirit, it is a miraculous transformation they are no longer who they used to be they are an absolute new creation without getting too scientific within a woman's womb you have two elements that independently have no semblance to what is then formed when joined together what you're looking for within yourself at all times but also the measure of is this person or are they not born again is do you see a new creation? Right here sits my mom, even though we look nothing alike. This is my mom, and she was the first. She is the litmus test to be able to testify to the world if I truly became a new creation the day that I was born again. Now, I began to clean my room. I began to treat her with more respect. I began to help make... Uh, my bed, do the dishes. All those external things were good, but I did them because the conviction of the Holy Ghost of the fifth commandment began to overwhelm me, and I realized I had a hard heart. And God gave me a heart of flesh that could obey my mom, love her, and respect her. But she was able to look into my eyes and see that is not the son that I gave birth to. That is a new creation. In order to see... In order to enter the kingdom of God, you must be born again. But there's a process that you get to that point. And I'm more so sharing this with you guys as a sobering element of looking into your own walk, but also how do you share this with other people? You have to identify what the problem is. If someone is not willing to repent of their sins, they're not willing to admit to the evil inclination that's within their heart, then you're not giving them the opportunity to display obedience that determines the verdict. You have to deal with the problem first. So Titus chapter 3, verse 3. 
Y'all still with me? Yes. Verse 3 through 7. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Two identifying markers of what the work of the Holy Spirit is within mankind, why Jesus was sent to earth, and not just sent to earth, but died on a cross as an innocent man, took on your sin and resurrected from the dead. His purpose was so that all of mankind could have rebirth and renewal by his spirit. What was hovering over the waters of the deep in Genesis 1? The spirit of God. The spirit of God is sent to magnify or make known Jesus who came to make the Father known. That when we submit to the working of this Holy Spirit, we have a process that identifies the problem that's within us, is able to declare the verdict of where we stand, but also where we can stand. That was the disparity. You know, that night that I was born again, it's February 17th, 1992, in my bedroom, reading a tract, convicted by the Holy Ghost that there was a disparity between me and God, but more importantly, I was a slave. I was a slave to my own sinful nature. No matter how good I strove to be or strive to be, I couldn't get free of it. But what also was made plain to me was how I could get free. And that was asking Jesus to take absolute and full control of my life. It was asking him to forgive me of yielding to my sinful nature and being a slave to it by choice. You know, that's the real decision, is that when you are confronted with the opportunity to be free, once that freedom is made known, now you have a choice. Do you want to stay a slave because it's pleasurable, because there's leeks and onions there? Or do you want to venture out into the unknown wilderness of depending upon the living God? What do you want? There is freedom, but it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you the security of what sin promised you but never fulfilled. So we have the problem. We have the verdict where you are and where you can be, but there is a price to pay. You all ready to learn about that price? Let's learn it. Let's go to Luke chapter 14, verse 25. The cost to enter the kingdom of God, the cost to be born of the Spirit, is everything. And I mean that in the multi-directions that it, it just sounded like. It will cost you everything. But here's the other side of it. You will gain everything. Whoever wants to find his life must first do what? Lose it. Lose it. That's awkward. It's hard. You know, I've been serving Jesus for now 20 years. And you know what? He still finds idols in my life. He still finds pride within my heart. He still challenges the evil inclination that constantly tries to rise up. And then together, we take a sword and we cut its head off. And it dies. You know what happens? A new day. I wake up the next morning and guess what? There it is again. We got to deal with it. You know what the difference is? It's not my master anymore. I'm able to subdue it by the blood of Jesus. I'm no longer on a chain being drug against my will in a direction I don't want to go. I fight it, and I win. 
Luke 14, 25, large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. The cost of being born again is everything. But the repayment program is everything. I tell everybody that if I was living according to the 10-year plan that I had, obviously, 10 years ago, I would have sold myself seriously short of the good things that God has provided for me. But I had to first give up all my dreams, all my aspirations, all my hopes. I had to give up my fears. Come on, if we're honest about looking into the mirror of God's words, the majority of the decisions that we make are based upon what can or we don't want to happen to our lives. Why don't we put on our seatbelts? Eh, to save our life. It's a very wise and practical thing to do. Does that mean the next missions trip you go on, you won't get inside of a car because they don't have a seatbelt? At that moment, if that has been a fear that has gripped you all of your life because you experienced a car wreck at a very young age, but now you are faced, do I or do I not do the will of God because of this fear? This is the foundation that you are to build on. I will step into that car. I will sit in that seat, and I will be just content and happy and fine to not wear a seatbelt because I began with a state of giving Jesus my life. In fact, I hate my life in comparison to my love for Jesus. Now, obviously, I don't hate my mom. I love my mom. She cooks good. I keep her around for a little bit. I don't hate my wife. I don't hate my children. But this is at Calvary Comer, the light and the heavy, that the disparity between the love for God and the love for my life and everything that's attached to it is the equal distance of hate, that there's a huge gap, that I'm sure that if I were one of my children, I would want my dad to adore me, love me, spend every time, every moment, center his life around mine, but that is not the gospel. The gospel is to center your life around a love for God, and he will meet the needs for your wife for your children, for your mother, for your father. He will give them so much more than your idolizing of them ever would. Come on, we pass by the parks on Saturdays and see the soccer games. You see the, the gung-ho parents that they have structured their entire life around a baseball game or around a soccer game. And they are throwing their children into the pits of hell while they're doing it because they are building on a foundation that's other than a love for God. But when you go out to street ministry on Saturdays, when you worship in your homes, when you do what you are called to do, but bring your children by your side to do it with you, and then you train them up in what you have been gifted to do so that it prepares them to be on good footing to go do what God calls them to do, that's the process of showing them how to count the cost, but also how to reap the reward of the kingdom of God. But we got to lose everything first. Colossians chapter 1. So we identify the problem. We identify the possibility of verdict. And we identified the cost. You know why I didn't give you all about four or five more scriptures on cost? Because it just costs you everything. That Luke 14 is pretty straightforward. It tells you exactly what it is. It's your whole life. If you need more than that, then uh, well, let's have some more one-on-one -on -one time. A little bit later on. But once you've identified what the cost is and you say yes, Yes, I will step up to the plate. Jesus, I will give you my whole life because I know that what is out there in your kingdom is a heck of a lot better than what's on in, within mine. 
Come on, look to your neighbor and say, get off the throne. Kingdoms are established by kings. It's a king's dominion. And a symbol of a king's dominion is his castle, but more importantly, are you guys say this about your recliner? It's your throne. And when somebody else sits in your throne that's not a king, that's anarchy. That should evoke an anger. I look at my dog. I don't ask my dog, can I sit back in my recliner again? I tell my dog, get up. Get out of my chair. He does not belong in that rightful position because he is not, or she, is not king of that castle. I'm the king of that castle. So when we are confronted with the truth, with the living word of God that cuts between joint and marrow, even soul and spirit, judging the thoughts and attitudes of our heart, what the word of God is trying to say is get off my throne. And that throne is your heart. That is the center of your being and your life. That we are supposed to be challenged at every moment by the word of God, by the truth and standard of who he is, because we got to get off that throne. Part of my testimony is that I read that scripture, I read that, that track, and in it, it had two circles. Both had a throne. One had dots of different sizes in a chaotic pattern. The other had dots of the same size in a very orderly pattern. I like pictures. That's what speaks to me. I remember movies more than I remember books. If they would have shown me movies in high school in English class, I would have aced every test. But I didn't. It didn't happen that way. I saw within these two pictures, I was on the throne of my life. That's why I had the chaotic problems that I did. And what I needed was to get off of that throne, stand on the outside of my life, and make it available for Jesus to be 100% Lord. You know where Jesus drove me to by the age of 16? He drove me to the point of looking at my life and saying, you are failing at running your own life. You're horrible at this. You strive so hard to fulfill that deep, dark hole in the center of your being, and you are failing. You guess at this. You guess at that. You try this. You try that. You stink at this. You were not designed to run your life. God was. That the throne of the heart of man only has one king, and that is Jesus. Anytime we try to reclaim that throne, we are essentially kicking him off of it and becoming a king to ourself. There was a guy in 1 Samuel 23 named Nabal. Read about him. See how it turned out for him. So y'all ready to get off the throne? Colossians 1, verse 13. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son that he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So go back to 13. You know, I, I just was drawn to this verse and stared at it for a while today because I had some terminology mixed up inside my head that was, I think, influenced by watching too many movies. And I thought that in the word, it said the kingdom of darkness. It doesn't. It says the dominion. So I said, okay, let me pull up PC Study Bible and do some research. Make sure that the people at NIV are really doing their job because I think I have it right in my own head. So I'll look, and it means dominion, but it is distinctly different than kingdom. And I want to explain the difference, the disparity between dominion of darkness and the kingdom of the sun. It begins with, there is only one kingdom, because there's only one king. There is no other ruler of this universe. That what the Jews would pray every single day when they would pull the talit over the head, they'd say, Baruch Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Melech Ha'olam. 
Bless you, O Lord, our God, creator, maker, ruler, king of the universe. There is only one kingdom because there's only one king. And therefore, there's only one person who has the right and authority to sit on the throne of your life and in your heart. If there's anything else, they're an enemy of God. And that includes you. So what it boils down to is dominion. For those of you taking notes, it's Strong's number 1849. Get this. This is where it becomes beautiful. Dominion is the power, or in this term, 1849, the power of doing something. So when you give something dominion, you give them the power to do something within that dominion. You give them the ability. You give them the freedom, the right, power, or authority. When did the dominion of darkness get the right? over mankind. It was with Adam. You and I inherited in our DNA, in our makeup of being made in the image of God, but through the first Adam, we inherited this evil inclination that gave the dominion of darkness the power, the freedom, the ability, and the right over your life. That's why sin was your master if you are now born again. That's why sin is the master of those who are not. That's why it rules you and you have no power over it because you cannot trump the dominion of darkness because it has a legal right to your life if it's undealt with by the blood of Jesus. It's not until the one rightful king takes his place and overthrows this dominion that you can be free from it. You go from being enslaved to sin to now being at war with sin. I would say being at war is a much better place. I may get fired at, but it ain't going to tell me what to do. Tell it to shut up. That's what we do. In the name of Jesus. I'm serious. I'm serious. That's part of my testimony, too. And look, I'm not successful every single time. But the early part of my walk as a young man, every five seconds, every two seconds, I had to battle with certain kind of thoughts. And it plagued my mind to the point it was driving me crazy. And I thought that I wasn't born again. But what I realized is that I was no longer a slave to what went through my mind. I was now at war with it. And what I would have to tell my flesh is dirt, get down, which is essentially saying, shut up. I ain't got to listen to you anymore. By the blood of Jesus, die, 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 die. So Colossians 1, let's skip over to Colossians 2, verse 13 through 16. And this is where it gets powerful. When you were dead, come on, everybody say dead. Does dead have life in it? Did you have life before Jesus? No matter what mirage or illusion that you think that it was, it was dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, your yetzerah, God made you alive with Christ. This is that Ezekiel 36. I will take your heart of stone out. I will put in you a new heart of flesh and a new spirit. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us, and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. Y'all remember some movie put out not long ago called Return of the King? That when Jesus stepped into mankind, he was made like his brothers in every way, but yet was without sin, like Hebrew says. That the first return of the king was to free his people from slavery. And he did it in a way that was absolutely different. You know, over and over again, what he preached when he was uh, starting his ministry, he said, repent for the kingdom of God is near. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. 
repent for the kingdom, repent for the kingdom. When he told parables, you know what he said? The kingdom of God is like. And he compared to something in their normal life to what the kingdom of God was like because he came to preach the good news of the kingdom of God. And that good news was, you're free. I'm here to release you from bondage. I'm here to set up God's kingdom on earth that will not only challenge the kingdom of darkness, or the, I'm sorry, the dominion of darkness, it will overthrow the dominion of darkness. I mean, y'all seen the, the military movies or the World War II shows? We had Germany occupying a portion of land that was not rightfully theirs and oppressing and enslaving the people. And the allies come in and the kingdom shows up. It shows up to confront and yet and then overthrow the kingdom that was in place or the dominion that was in place. Jesus showed up into mankind to overthrow the dominion, the power, the right that sin had over your life. That's why he showed up. It's that good news that Jesus came to preach. In fact, I want to show you that. Let's go to uh, Matthew 4, verse 23. There, y'all still getting there? Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching in their synagogues because he was Jewish. Preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. You know, this hit me by surprise in a sense where for some reason I never put these two together. That we're called to go preach new, the good news. And the good news is that Jesus has come to destroy the power of sin, to cancel the written code, to liberate us into walking in freedom, and to be born again, a new creation within God. But before he ever did that, he came preaching good news too. And the good news was is that the kingdom of God is near. It's here. It was at work within him. And he knew and was preaching and demonstrated by healing every disease and sickness among the people that sin no longer has reign. That its dominion is being overthrown. Now don't get me wrong. Just because you're sick and just because you have a disease does not mean that sin is mastering you. But the effects of sin are within all of mankind. That this is that struggle within Romans 6 and 7. That who will rescue me from this body, this man of death? Thanks be to Jesus Christ our Lord. He set foot on earth to rescue mankind, creation. If he starts with mankind, it bleeds down to all of creation. But he came to proclaim freedom to the captives. And that's captive to sin, captive to the effects of sin. And let's drill down on that a little bit. You, you are able to look into the mirror and you're able to say, I am free by the blood of Jesus. That you know what? If cancer is at work in my body, I got two options and I got two hopes. One, we'll get you guys to lay hands on me and I'll be healed in the name of Jesus and I'll never see your bad report again. But you know what my other option is? I'm going to resurrect. Sin is defeated by the blood of Jesus. I don't care which way you get there. The resurrection is the final exclamation point of he has won. He has won and he is risen. Saints, we're to put our hope fully in that the kingdom of God is near, but more importantly, it's in you. If you have confronted the problem that the Holy Ghost has shown you, if you have declared, the verdict is, I'm not guilty. I'm not declared that I am guilty, but I want to be not guilty. And thereby counting the cost of what it takes to follow Jesus, what it takes to gain this freedom. 
and you accept the kingdom of God in your heart, that's how the born again process happens. That there is something holding me bondage, but I want to be free to live. And you can. Don't be a slave any longer. When the Holy Ghost brings to surface something that is still an idol, it is still an area that is in bondage, or you feel like it's just beating you, don't feel like you're a slave or subject to it. Rise up to it. Hit it head on with the word of God and say, I am free in the name of Jesus. Cry out to God. Say, Lord, I need your blood to wash over me. I need your sorrow to fill me. Worldly sorrow leads to death. You know why? Because worldly sorrow says, I'm sorry I got caught. Worldly sorrow does not remove guilt. But godly sorrow leads to repentance that leaves no regret. No regret whatsoever. If I asked every worst person in this room to begin to write a list of the things you did wrong before Jesus, before Jesus, number one, we might be here a while, but secondly, you're probably very tentative to write those things on that list. Jesus came to cancel that written code that stood as judgment against you. Not guilty. Not guilty. Colossians 2. I'm sorry, Colossians 1. Verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by him all things were created. That's you. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy, the rightful place as a king. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. The good news about the kingdom is that the king has come. The king has come to make peace. The king is here and at work of crushing the dominion of darkness. And it begins within the heart of man. Let the king rule every part of your heart. The quicker that you open up to give him everything, the quicker you can have sin defeated in your life. Let's go all or nothing, amen? amen. Let's be sold out for Jesus. Come on, stand to your feet.